Sup, chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, everybody already knows that the hair loss industry is absolutely full of scams. The sheer number of scam products and programs sold online promising to help stop hair loss and regrow hair, it can be overwhelming at times. But if you take time to critically examine these scams as I have, you'll notice that almost all of them center around the same idea. They claim that you can regrow hair by improving blood flow to the scalp. And these scams have been around for centuries. Centuries. Now, anyone who has followed this channel for a while will tell you that this is definitely not a new subject for me. I have made almost as many videos debunking the blood flu theory as I have debunking fear mongering about finasteride. I even made a video last month summarizing all the reasons why scalp tension and blood flow do not cause hair loss. Yet, the scalp tension slash blood flu theory just refuses to die. So, in this video, I would like to present even more evidence against it, as well as answer some objections that seem to come up every time I post a video debunking this old obsolete theory. First of all, let's start with a history lesson. The original blood flow theory dates back to over a century ago. Back then, it was simply known as the blood flow theory, but it was a pretty stupid idea even by the standards of the 20th century. The theory was that the reason why men went bald was because they wore hats with tight headbands. The headbands were compressing the blood vessels of the scalp, so the hair on the scalp wasn't getting enough blood and it just died off from a lack of oxygen. This theory was debunked over a hundred years ago when this scientist here named Dorothy the Osborne published a paper showing that the pattern of hair loss didn't match the pattern of hats. Instead, she showed that male pattern baldness was an inherited condition. It makes perfect sense that the hats weren't causing hair loss, because otherwise you would have expected that men would have suddenly stopped going bald when men wearing hats fell out of fashion back in the 1960s. But the modern day scalp tension Gallia apoderotica cells will respond to this by saying, but Kevin, that's the old version of the blood flow theory. Now we know that it's actually muscle tension in the Gallia aponeurotica that stops blood flu, blah, 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 blah. Just stop it. Don't worry, we're going to get to all the many feeble attempts to alter the blood flu theory to better fit with the contemporary hair loss science in just a moment, but let's backtrack for just a moment before we do. I think the Gallia cells are missing one of the most important points from Dorothy Osborne's debunking of the theory that tight headbands cause hair loss. The point is, is that if the blood flu theory were correct, then tight headbands should have caused hair loss and the pattern should have matched the pattern of the hat band, but it doesn't. Hats back in the early 20th century were deliberately very tight in order to prevent them from flying off in the wind. If you believe that tension in your scalp muscles is enough to cut off the blood flow and cause hair loss, then certainly the habit of wearing a hat with a tight headband throughout the day would do the very same thing. So logic would then dictate that the incidence of male pattern baldness should have gone way down after men stopped wearing hats, which didn't happen despite the fact that not nearly as many men wear hats today compared to the early 20th century when literally every man wore a hat. So if tight headbands around a hat didn't cause hair loss, why would tight muscles cause hair loss? The fact is, you may think it is a ridiculous thing that anyone would ever think that wearing a hat could cause hair loss, but the idea of muscle tension causing hair loss is equally as absurd, and so is the idea that massaging your scalp for 40 minutes a day would do anything to promote blood flow and hair growth. So anyways... The hat theory was the original blood flu theory, and since it was debunked, scammers had to modify the theory in order to modernize it to make it more palatable to their victims. So the next step was to say, okay, it isn't the hats, it's the muscles of the head that are blocking the blood flow. Here's an image of the muscles of the head, and in it you can see that there are muscles on the front and back as well as the sides of the head. On top of the head, there is a sheet of connective tissue that connects to these muscles called the cranial aponeurosis or gallia aponeurotica. So, the hat theory morphed into the theory that these head muscles are chronically tight for some unknown reason, and this tightness compresses the blood vessels underneath this muscle layer so that the blood flow to the scalp is effectively cut off. We'll get into why this is stupid, or possibly even more stupid than the tight headband theory in a moment, but before we do that, let's first fast forward from 1916 to 1959, which is the date when the blood flow theory suffered its second major setback. It was in that year that Dr. Orendreich published his seminal paper that showed that the hair in men with androgenic alopecia showed donor dominance. That meant that hair from the donor region would grow normally even when transplanted to the balding regions. So whatever was causing hair loss had nothing to do with blood flow of the region. Instead, it was due to the intrinsic properties of each hair follicle. Dr. Orendreich also showed that hair from balding scalp transplanted to the donor area continued to miniaturize at the same rate. His findings 
findings were later confirmed by Dr. Nordstrom, who showed that both balding and normal hair transplanted to the forearm maintained their characteristics despite being transplanted. He came to the conclusion that, quote, the male pattern balding process of the hair follicle is not reversed by a change in its location on the human body, unquote. But the biggest nail in the blood flu theory's coffin was discovered just a few years before Dr. Nordstrom's paper. This was the discovery about DHT's role in hair loss by Dr. Julian Imperato McGinley. In 1974, Dr. Imperato McGinley found that men with a genetic deficiency of the 5 air enzyme and very low DHT levels never developed androgenic alopecia. Never. So DHT was found to be the central culprit in androgenic alopecia, and this led to the eventual development of finasteride as a means to lower DHT and effectively treat male pattern hair loss. To any sane person, this discovery would have ended the debate once and for all about the blood flu theory since it was clear that hair loss was related to a specific enzyme, the 5AR enzyme, and had nothing at all to do with blood flu. But the blood flu theory, much like Olgierd von Everick from The Witcher 3, refuses to die, even after its head has been cut off. So I'm sure all the Gallia cells were pretty depressed by all this new info about DHT, which debunked their bullshit. That was at least until 1989, though, when this article was published, which breathed new life into the rotting corpse of the blood flu theory. In the article, the actual blood flow in the scalps of balding men was measured and compared to the blood flow in men with normal hair. It was found that the blood flow in the scalps of balding men was 2.6 times lower than the blood flow in the scalps of men with normal hair. However, Dr. Klemp, the author of the study, correctly pointed out that this difference in blood flow might be just a correlation and didn't imply that low blood flow caused hair loss. He stated in the article, quote, However, we cannot conclude whether the reduced subcutaneous blood flow is primary, secondary, or irrelevant for the etiology of early male pattern baldness from the present study." Unquote. But the Gallia cells completely glossed over this. They also glossed over another very important finding from this study, and that is that the blood flow in the scalp is literally a torrent of blood, because the normal scalp blood flow is 10 times higher than any other anatomic region. Even in the balding scalp, which has 2.6 times lower blood flow, that's still more blood flow than any other anatomic region. It turns out that even in the balding scalp, the blood flow is very, very high. We know that men can grow a full beard in a region of the face that has less blood flow than what was seen in the scalps of balding men in this study. So even if the blood flow in the scalp were reduced, the region would still receive plenty of blood to grow hair. If you were to take a scalpel to the scalp of a bald man, it would still bleed very profusely. And that is because even in bald men, the scalp is one of the most vast vascular regions of the body. So even with a relative reduction in blood flow, the scalp still receives more blood than any other part of the body. So it begs the question, why would that cause the miniaturization seen in androgenic alopecia when miniaturization is not seen in other parts of the body where hair grows despite receiving even less blood flow than the balding scalp? Anyways, at the time this study was published, it was already clear from the work of Dr. Imperato McGinley and many other researchers that male pattern baldness was related to increased DHT levels in the hair follicles, and therefore, grifters knew that in order to save their dying theory, the blood flu theory had to morph again to account for this new data. The snake oil salesmen and hairline fraud sales were getting desperate at this point because the evidence behind DHT's role in hair loss was too overwhelming to outright dismiss. They had to find some way to convince people that a lack of blood flow was still somehow causing hair loss, but in order to make their scam believable, they had to find some way to fit DHT into the blood flow theory. Snake oil salesmen were about to be out of the job here, so was there anyone left who could help save scalp tension cells from complete irrelevancy? Well, it seems like their prayers to the god of grifters were finally answered, because along came Dr. Goldman with this article that he published in 1996. Dr. Goldman performed his research on just nine bald men and nine men with normal hair. In the study, Dr. Goldman found lower blood flow and oxygen levels in the scalps of balding men versus the men with normal hair, which is similar to what Dr. Klemp found in his own research. However, in order to try to fit the blood flow theory into what we know about DHT's role in hair loss, Dr. Goldman made a completely unreferenced and unsubstantiated claim that low oxygen levels would shut off the conversion of testosterone into estrogen and cause increased conversion of testosterone into DHT. Now, I want to emphasize a very important 
important point here because nobody ever seems to talk about this. This idea from Dr. Goldman was nothing but pure speculation on his part. There is absolutely no documentation that the oxygen levels found in the scalps of balding men would have any effect on the synthesis of DHT. No measurements were taken to test this hypothesis. Nothing whatso fucking ever. Yet despite this, Gallia cells treat this speculation as gospel even though nothing about it has ever been verified and if anything, actual research suggests that the opposite may be true. This is borne out by research showing that low oxygen levels stimulate a hair growth factor called HIF or hypoxia inducible factor. This factor actually is triggered by low oxygen levels and results in hair growth. There is even a hair growth stimulant on the market today called stomoxidine that actually works through this very mechanism. But what we actually know now is that decreased blood flow measured in the scalp of balding men is the result, not the cause of androgenic alopecia. When hair follicles die, the capillaries associated with them die as well, so therefore the amount of blood flow goes down as a result of having fewer capillaries in the scalp. We now know that these capillaries are actively destroyed by, you guessed it, DHT, and this was shown in the article here that I went over, along with a lot of other information on my recent scalp tension debunk video, which I'll link below. However, the most damning argument against the blood flow theory is that it is impossible. I'm not talking about impossible in the sense that it would be impossible to verify. No, what I mean is that the theory itself is literally impossible. It is impossible because it is based on an incorrect understanding of the anatomy of the scalp. The theory is, is that the muscles surrounding the scalp are chronically tight, which causes the gallia aponeurotic to be tight, which therefore squeezes the blood vessels so they can't deliver enough blood to the scalp. Unfortunately, the people who believe this theory, they apparently never bothered to even look at an anatomy book. Here's the figure we looked at before which shows the muscles of the head, and here's another figure showing the blood vessels that supply blood to the scalp. So take a good look at this. Look at the vessels and look at the muscles. You notice anything about this, Chums? The blood vessels aren't under the muscles or under the gallia aponeurotica. They run on top of these structures, so they cannot be affected by muscle tension. To better understand this, let's look at the anatomy of the scalp's vascular network in more detail. There are several layers of blood vessels in the head. There are arteries that run deep inside the skull that provide blood to the brain. There are arteries that run through the muscles, giving the muscles oxygen, but the arteries that supply blood blood to the scalp run above the muscles as you can clearly see in this image here. They run above the muscles and above the gallia aponeurotica which is in the same layer as the facial muscles. So these muscles and the gallia are located below the superficial blood vessels. So there is no way whatsoever that tight muscles of a tight gallia would compress these superficial blood vessels and limit blood flow to the scalp. It is anatomically impossible. Now. I have heard rumors recently that certain medical editors, when faced with the unfortunate facts of this anatomy, have tried to grasp at straws to salvage this debunked theory, which they have so foolishly made a focal point of their business. Medical editors claim that there are some blood vessels that penetrate from the deep layers to the superficial layers of the scalp, and that scalp tension could squeeze them off. For example, these medical editors note that the deep temporal artery lies within the muscles of the head and could be squeezed by muscle tension. However, the deep temporal artery supplies blood to the temporalis muscle, not to the scalp. They also note that two small arteries associated with the blood supply to the muscle surrounding the eyes, called the supraorbital artery and the supratrochlear artery, have a complex course and penetrate the frontalis muscle just above the eyes. These arteries have branches that reach the scalp where they connect with the much larger superficial temporal artery. However, the main targets of these arteries are the regions around the eyes and the middle part of the forehead as you can see in these figures. These are small arteries that don't actually supply blood to the temporal regions and vertex of the scalp, which are supplied by much larger arteries like the superficial temporal artery. If you look at the detailed anatomy of the layers of the scalp, you can see clearly that the arteries and veins run in connective tissues that is just beneath the skin. Below that is the aponeurosis, also known as the gallia aponeurotica. This is also the layer where the muscles are. There are some blood vessels that connect the more superficial vessels to deeper vessels, but these are not arteries at 
at all. They are simply veins. Veins do not supply blood to the tissues like the scalp. They take blood away from the tissues so the blood goes back to the heart to be reoxygenated. So by the time the blood has reached these deeper veins, the blood has already delivered the oxygen to the hair follicles and is on its way back to the heart to collect more oxygen. These veins are called emissary veins. You can see them here. All they do is just help drain the venous blood from the scalp by draining it into the skull and even through the skull into the layers around the brain. If scalp tension cut off those veins, it wouldn't affect the arterial blood flow to the scalp and it actually wouldn't affect the blood flow away from the scalp either because there are plenty of veins in the superficial scalp to carry blood back to the heart. So. As should be pretty obvious by now, every time the blood flu theory is debunked, it comes back in a new form complete with some new bullshit explanation. So the latest form of the theory just jettisons the blood flu element entirely and now says instead that it is just the tension on the scalp that causes hair loss. So even most Gallia cells, they now admit that the blood flu theory is bullshit and in order to save their stupid obsolete theory, they are now claiming that scalp tension itself, independent from blood flu, must be causing inflammation releasing all sorts of mysterious negative growth factors that are causing hair loss. With this new modified scalp tension theory, you don't need to explain how scalp tension could cause decreased blood flow because it's just the scalp tension itself independent from blood flow that is causing all these problems. I often hear people promote this idea by telling me, but Kevin, isn't there a computer model of scalp tension that matches the pattern of male pattern baldness perfectly? What do you have to say about that, bro? So. The final last gasp of the blood flu theory is, well, it's not even blood flu at all. It's just scalp tension. And look, this computer model shows the scalp tension matches the pattern of male pattern hair loss, so that must prove scalp tension causes hair loss, right? Like I said, I debunked all this in my last scalp tension video, but let me briefly point out the faults of the study and then bring up some new details to further debunk it. First of all, the study did not actually measure scalp tension in the human head. It is simply a computer model based on a bunch of assumptions. And unlike any other computer model I know of, the researchers made no attempt to validate if the tension predicted by the model actually matched the tension in a real human scalp. Their endpoint was apparently just to match the typical pattern of male pattern baldness. And for all we know, they tweaked the parameters of their model to make it match. Also, as the authors themselves point out, they used a two-dimensional model to the scalp, even though the scalp is of a three-dimensional structure. And I remember I brought this up in my video debunking what I've learned's terrible video about hair loss while I was having this very long and autistic debate with someone in my comment section about it. When I went over the computer model about scalp tension though, it made me wonder about something. What about people who definitely don't have tight scalps? Do they ever get androgenic alopecia? And if they do, do they even get it in the typical Norwood pattern that people associate with scalp tension? Well, I did some research about this to figure out if there are any medical conditions that would cause people to have loose scalps, and it turns out there actually are some. There are various disorders that affect connective tissue and cause very saggy skin, as well as very flexible joints. These people obviously aren't going to have tight scalps. So can these people still get androgenic alopecia in the typical Norwood pattern? Well, let's first start with a syndrome called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It is a syndrome that is the result of a genetic defect in the synthesis of collagen in your body. Collagen is what gives the skin firmness and is what makes connective tissue resistant to stretching. That includes the skin itself as well as fibrous tissue like the Gallia aponeurotica. You can see an example in this picture of a woman with extremely saggy skin. She's only 28 years old, but her wrinkly skin makes her look a lot older. So when I did an internet search on Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, one of the first images that popped up was this guy named Brian Kavanaugh. He's an actor with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Now he has no hair on his head despite a full beard and I can't really tell if he has androgenic alopecia. I mean, it's possible he just has a buzz cut with fine hair, but this picture nevertheless may be suspicious that even with a lax scalp, you could still get androgenic alopecia. I just need to find a better example. So let's wind the clock back a bit and go back into the history of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And here's the first documented case of it. The man you see here is James Morris, who was born in 1859. He was part of the P.T. Barnum Circus and known as the Rubber Man. If you look at him, it is extremely obvious that 
possibility as prominent temporal recession, certainly consistent with antritic alopecia as we see in the Hamilton Norwood scale. He's losing hair in the pattern we assume to be of greatest scalp tension, even though he obviously does not have a tight scalp since he is the rubber man after all. But we don't have to go back to the 19th century. We have some medical reports documenting that antritic alopecia does indeed occur in men with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Now remember, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is pretty rare, so there isn't a whole lot of research on it. However, this article here reports on two cases of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and reviews other cases in the literature. Both of the cases had the typical very loose skin we associate with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, yet both cases had hair loss. In the first case, which was a 62-year-old man, hair loss was observed over the vertex and crown of the head, which is the typical pattern for antritic alopecia. In the second case featuring a 41-year-old woman, there is general thinning on the scalp, which is a typical pattern for female pattern hair loss. In reviewing the literature, the authors noted that 6 out of 11 cases showed hair thinning consistent with antritic alopecia. In addition, this transplant surgeon describes a 26-year-old man with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome who had undergone multiple hair transplant procedures for male pattern baldness. There is another condition that causes very loose scalp tissue as well, and that is what we are seeing in this video here. This is a condition called cutis vertesis gerata, where the scalp skin is loose and redundant. This causes an unsettling appearance on the scalp similar to a human brain. With all that extra skin, you probably wouldn't expect there to be any scalp tension at all, certainly at least not in the pattern suggested by the computer modeling study we saw earlier. Yet, this guy, despite having all that redundant scalp, seems to have balding of the vertex, just like anyone else who has male pattern hair loss. Here are before and after pictures of a guy who had surgical treatment for the condition. The surgery in question involves removing redundant skin and redundant tissue from the gallia aponeurotica in order to tighten the scalp. However, you see both before and after that this guy has temporal recession typical of the antritic alopecia pattern we associate with the Hamilton Norwood scale. So I went ahead and found other photos online of men with this condition, and you can see definite evidence that they can have male pattern hair loss typical of antritic alopecia, even though they all have loose scalps. So what does this all prove? Well. If the male pattern of hair loss occurs in men who have extremely stretchy skin, it looks like scalp tension has nothing to do with this pattern. That is because this pattern is encoded in our genes and scalp tension and blood flow have nothing at all to do with it. Finally, let's go ahead and address once again the recurring but my Botox argument that Gallia cells always like to make. It turns out that if you inject a lot of Botox into the muscle surrounding the scalp, you do get hair growth. Several studies have actually shown this. So Botox Botox relaxes muscles, so it relieves scalp tension. That's why it's sometimes used for headaches. Therefore, maybe it's possible that relieving scalp tension is what is causing hair growth. So does this prove that the scalp tension theory is actually true? Well, unfortunately for the Gallia cells and Botox cells, there's this study here that they'd rather you not see. In the study, Botox was injected directly into the scalp, not into the muscles. It was an intradermal injection, not an intramuscular injection. And yet, this injection induced hair growth. But even more important, Botox was shown to decrease TGF-beta-1, which is a known negative hair growth factor. So it's not necessary to invoke the muscle relaxing effects of Botox to explain its effects on stimulating hair growth. It has a direct biochemical effect on the hair follicles. Naturally, the Botox cells are crying foul about this intradermal study since it doesn't fit their narrative. They tried to refute it by saying that intramuscular injections of Botox yielded superior results, so clearly that must mean there has to be more to Botox's mechanism of action than just reductions in TGF-beta-1. It has to be about reducing muscle tension in the scalp too, right? Well, the reason that Botox injected into the muscles could work better is that the doses and numbers of injections were higher in the intramuscular studies than they were in the intradermal study. The intradermal study only used a total of 30 units of Botox at 20 sites, while a typical intramuscular study, like in the Zhao study, it used a total of 100 units of Botox at 30 sites. Botox diffuses throughout the tissues, and the higher the dose and the more injections you give, the more Botox will diffuse throughout the tissues. So, more hair growth growth with intramuscular injections doesn't mean that the improvement is due to decreasing scalp tension. The higher dose used and the greater number of injection sites will cause diffusion of the Botox directly into the hair follicles and the Botox will have a direct effect on the follicles that has nothing at all to do with scalp tension. In fact, when a higher dose of Botox is used intradermally, the result can be dramatic, such as in this patient shown here who had 100 units of Botox that were injected intradermally into the scalp. The Botox was not injected 
injected into the muscles. You can see the impressive result comparing the before picture on the left to the after picture on the right. So this proves that Botox is not the silver bullet that Gallia cells wished for, and in fact, no matter how hard they try to transmogrify the blood flow theory, it doesn't hold any water. You can kind of think of the blood flow theory to be the hair loss equivalent to Caitlyn Jenner. It keeps changing, but only gets uglier and stupider in the process. All this nonsense we keep hearing about blood flow, scalp tension, inflammation, blah blah blah, it just muddies the water. Androgenic alopecia is not some big enigma that researchers haven't figured out yet. We know it causes it. It's caused by genetic determinism that causes the overproduction of the trash hormone DHT in certain hair follicles, and it's that DHT that destroys our hair and makes us slapheads. That's why drugs that lower DHT like finasteride and dutasteride stop and reverse androgenic alopecia. The only reason we keep hearing about this scalp tension and blood flow nonsense is because snake oil salesmen would much rather see you lose your money and hair trying the bullshit they're offering rather than you just using what works. The mainstream medical knowledge about hair loss science doesn't serve the interest of scammers who want to sell you products and programs built on the foundations of a false theory. And it's not just the scammers who want to keep this obsolete theory alive. A lot of people who are too afraid to use finasteride, they will desperately cling on to any idea that gives them even the semblance of hope that they can save their hair without having to use finasteride. And scammers will amplify that false hope by offering them bullshit alternatives that don't work like scalp massages. There are going to be people out there who just don't have the balls to do what they need to do in order to save their hair. So these people, they will cope with these scam treatments down to their very last hair follicle while kicking and screaming the whole way. And when these cowards have finally lost the fight against the Norwood Reaper, will they just move on with their lives? No, of course they won't. They're going to instead spend the rest of their days with their ass super glued to the chair of their computer desk where they will argue endlessly about how dangerous finasteride is and how DHT is the supreme alpha hormone necessary for male virility and if you take it it's the same as transitioning into a woman. This is just how they rationalize their fears and failures because they are all complete losers. And who do losers hate more than anyone? Losers hate winners because winners are a reminder of their failures. Winners use finasteride while losers Losers cope with scam alternatives. Losers want to promote these scam alternatives so you'll be a loser just like them since misery loves company. So don't be a loser, chums. Take your finasteride and save your hair because your hair is more important than the ego of these anti-finasteride dorks. See you next time and God bless.